All right, welcome back, everybody. So I mentioned in my uh, talk this morning that we used to get to visit BC for some knowledge exchange stuff back in the early 2000s. And uh, this, this first slide I've got up on the page here, just from one of, one of those visits and one of my favorite places we went to, this is on the um, Shushwap River, kind of up by Penticton. And so we climbed out onto this log jam to hatch. And uh, if you see that black bear there in the center of the picture, she climbed up out of the, one of the holes and walked down that log, jumped in the river, and then swam off. So thought appropriate photo to start this presentation with. OK, so in that first presentation, we kind of went over how do we find appropriate valley types that we're going to that we're going to break into our response reaches and, and look at our zones for restoration. So what I want to do with this slide is kind of tie that that plan or excuse me, the profile view, which you see in the top graph to the, the plan view in the bottom slide there. And so we talked a little bit about slopes. We talked about valley constriction. And I just want to point out that neither one of those alone is the sole driver of some of these things that we're talking about. But what we're trying to do is look at those things together among with other factors. But what I'm trying to show you here in this slide is that if we go from left to right on that profile, we have that depositional valley segment 3C at the top. And, and you can see that it goes, oh, I don't know, 800 meters or so is one long continuous depositional valley. And we have that confluence fan coming in out of the north there that very much constricts and reduces the, the, the available process space for the river through that neighborhood, but it didn't break the valley profile. And also want to point out that I think this is kind of counterintuitive a lot of times for people. People assume that constriction equals higher slope. And that's, not, again, not always the case. So you'll see the, the broad unconfined valley to the left is a higher slope than, than, this, than the lower part of that valley where things are more constricted and forced into a single thread alignment. And as we keep moving downstream, you see that little piece of red where we call it valley segment 3B, a little transport piece where the river is, again, squished between two confluence fans, forcing a break in valley profile where it is a single thread and, and transport piece of river through that neighborhood before going into valley segment 3A, which is, again, starts to flare out and, and becomes a, a broad, unconfined valley once again. So just kind of want to set that as a little bit of a context for some of the things we're going to be talking through, because we'll, we'll see this come up again in a couple of the examples. So the REMs, that, those color coatings of the valley floor that I showed in that previous slide is kind of a, these are relative elevation models. So relative to the geomorphic grade line. So not relative to sea level or bank full. Sometimes people build them relative to water surface and things like that. So what, what your elevations are relative to, I think are extremely important. So what, what I'm showing you here is relative to the valley profile is what we're we're detrending to. So I think I, I show these REMs quite a bit to show kind of the, the fluvial process space within a valley and what we might, what kind of features we might expect to see within those. But I think these need a little bit of translation. So I, I think probably almost every single time I show one of these, people ask to see cross sections of the valley. So thought we'd use the Rosetta Stone here and decipher wh exactly what an REM is showing. So in that B panel at the bottom, I've got a cross section that goes from uh, left around that valley. And on the top, that's the cross section through those points. And so what we want to, I want you to draw your attention to here is on the left Y axis, we have elevation above mean sea level. So uh, it looks like it ranges from 495 meters to 500 meters on the left. But on the right is the relative elevations. So the, the target elevation for this particular cross section, based on that valley profile, looks like it's uh, about 497.8 meters. So that's going to be our zero elevation. And so the color coatings that you see in that, that cross section at the top are just showing how high or low elevations within the cross section sit relative to that elevation. So what we'll do is just 
go through this left to right and start on the cross section at number one. <laughs> Sorry, my office mate here does not like UPS drivers. <laughs> uh, so if, if we go down to the REM at the bottom of the screen, <laughs> the station one is showing what looks to be uh, an off channel kind of uh, beaver wetland type complex at, at the tow wall of, of at the edge of the valley. As we move right on that cross section, you see that the surfaces rise up and they're right at target elevation before dipping back down into the pinks at, at point number two. And so this is not bathymetric LIDAR, this is just green LIDAR. So uh, my elevations are showing the water surface of the Intiat River here. And then below that, that orange dot is actually the surveyed in bed elevation at this cross section. So you can see the bed of the Intiat River is two meters below our geomorphic grade line target elevation at this given cross section. If you keep sliding right on that cross section between points two and three, you'll see that we've got several surfaces that are really close to the geomorphic grade line. And then we slide into point three, which on the cross section looks very much like the point one, you know, like this wetland complex. But having the advantage of looking at this in, in the REM on the image below, we can see that point three, there's a large segment of, of the valley that sits pretty much at that geomorphic grade line. But what's happening is we, as we get flood flows coming over that feature now with the channel, we have so much hydraulic head between that surface and then the current Intiat River's elevation now. What we're actually seeing happen is the real-time incision or head cutting of, of that feature and as you see in the REM, you can see the pink colors going to the darker blue to the lighter blue. So these are active head cuts moving up through that relic valley floor surface. If we keep moving to the right, you see number four on the cross section and, and down on the REM, we've got some kind of a flood embankment or revetment, something along there. Uh, probably some lateral migration type structure. And then five looks like it's probably the borrow pit where they took that material from to create that. And as you keep going across uh, points six, seven, eight, and nine, those are all relic flow paths that are basically sitting right at that geomorphic grade line. So if you see that dotted cross section or the dotted line in our cross section at top, that's our, our zero elevation. And, and those relic flow paths are basically skimming right along that, that surface. Whereas on the, on the positive end of the spectrum, the things that kind of rise up into the green zones, uh, points 10, if, if we take that back down to the REM, those are our surfaces that are sitting above the geomorphic grain line. And so these are gonna be like our vegetated islands. This is where we would expect to see our willows and our cottonwood galleries growing on these islands between those, those wetted flow paths shown in that REM. So, and another important part of this that I, I don't do a good job of bringing up, but I, I want to state is along the lines of what Colin showed you when he, he showed you the, uh, the alluvial aquifer for that white juice example, when the, when the valley's restored, fully restored connectivity, the base flow wetted alluvial aquifer elevation basically mirrors that geomorphic grade line. So the dotted line in that cross section at the top. And so we have water that's, supporting and underneath all those surfaces at that elevation at base flow. And if we go back down to the REM at points 11, you can see the result of that. Those are Springbrook heads that are originating as, as that alluvial aquifer expression of water. Those aren't flow through paths, but those are more that uh, alluvial aquifer being daylighted and expressed right through there. So, so that's kind of a translation of what the REM is showing us and, and how it shows us uh, elevations within there. And then this bracketing that I've shown here, this is kind of just the fluvial range of elevations that we'd expect to see this particular river occupying, both as far as its channel features and its depositional features. And, and that's unique to this river. Every single river is going to have some variability. So um, I'm just showing this as an example. So our next step after we build this in GIS, or you can do it in AutoCAD, whatever software you like to work in, what we're going to do is we'll take this map 
and I make a geo-referenced image of it and you can put it on your phone or your GPS, whatever, whatever you take to the field. But we're going to walk around and explore this landscape with these relative elevations and make adjustments to the bracketing. So maybe I, you know, maybe my target elevation needs to be a little bit broader or narrower from for each of these different colors, color bands. So, but you're going to use field indicators to make those determinations. So in this example, uh, the greens is kind of where I expect to see my riparian forest forming. So I'm going to the field and in the green zones, I see this large cedar in the foreground sitting at that target elevation. I'm looking for these kind of pieces of evidence to support yes or no that I've got my banding correct. And similarly, you go to the places that are colored as light blue and scrape off the duff layer. And here you see my boot and, and the, the small gravel substrates that are present on that you know, now fully disconnected surface. But these are indicators that yes, indeed, that was the, the river floor at one point. So with all that, it, it changes completely how we see the riverine environment. So this is the Intiatqua, um, the Intiat River in central Washington. And flow is coming towards us in this scene. And in my early days, you know, we asked at the end of that last presentation about our mistakes. In, in my early career, when I look at a scene like this, I would have been thinking, we have the Intiat River and then a floodplain adjacent to it, right? And I would, have, I would have jumped straight into the river here and been mapping out the features and, and habitat elements within the river and evaluating, you know, which ones I think are functioning well, which ones are not, and then coming up with a scheme to make in-stream habitats better. So maybe I'm putting log jams over those pools and, and things of that nature. And so that's, that's kind of that channel centric view that, that we were mentioning earlier versus now we're painting the whole valley in its relative elevation map and seeing this in an entirely different light. So now I'm, I'm seeing that the Intiat River is, is color coded in pink here, meaning incision on, on my color scheme. And you can color code these any way you like. This is just what makes sense to me. And if I look at the rest of the landscape, I see a bunch of greens and blues. So again, those blues are surfaces that sit at the geomorphic grade line at the valley profile elevations. And so those are the relic flow paths of the river. So rather than being a floodplain adjacent to this river, this is showing me that, that those were the riverbed elevations, right? And then the green is, again, those forested or riparian forest areas in between those flow paths, between those anabranching channels. And so as far as coming up with a restoration scheme for this, uh, this is a little small, but you might be able to see it. Basically, very similar to what Jared and Damien were sharing with us, it's largely trying to recognize what features on this landscape are natural and ones that we work with and around versus which ones are anthropogenic and, and we want to remove. So in this particular example, we can see a couple of levees or embankments. So we're gonna be targeting features like those as our cut. And when we cut them, we're gonna be cutting them all the way down to the geomorphic grade line elevation. And then recycling that material to lift the incised riverbed back up to the geomorphic grade line spread our woody debris on the surfaces, and then that's basically a completed project. So your disturbance footprint, if we call it kind of the control alt delete or the valley reset a little bit, but it's, it's largely focusing on those anthropogenic features and trying to erase those to reconnect the, the river back to its former surfaces. And in doing so, that translates that same scene into something that resembles what you see on the right panel. So if we can put those two side by side, the current river channel and a floodplain versus a river wetland corridor in the panel to the right. And so this is kind of really the target of what we're trying to accomplish with our restoration schemes. And then once we have this kind of vision, now we can start to put quantifiable objectives to this landscape and, and compare how much and, and what types of habitat we have, you know, the diversity of habitats, the ecological richness that a scene like the one on the right might provide compared to the one on the left. 
And if I pan out just a little bit further, I, I just want to show you the extreme amount of diversity in the landscape. I think a lot of times when we present this stage zero restoration, a lot of the pictures that you see are, are of these big wetland complexes, and, and those are spectacular and beautiful. And I think people have a, a tendency to think that everything looks like that, and that's all that's all stage zero is. And, and so with this slide, what I'm trying to do is paint the picture that it's it's a whole suite of different habitats that are all within that that range. So this is one continuous segment of the Intiat River. And if you look at the LIDAR hillshade there in the center, Again, like that first slide showed, we have a spot that's pinched between two confluence fans and it's going to be a single thread channel through there. That is all there is space to fit in there, but it's still going to be at the geomorphic grade line elevations. And if we think about what those habitats in there might look like, we've got constriction. We're going to have riparian forest, you know, probably conifers right up against the stream edges. We might have larger substrate sizes because of those confluence fans. So these might be our really prime time spawning neighborhoods, probably getting hyperic flow through those confluence fans. So a bunch of upwelling as it hits the river. So this might be just a phenomenal spawning neighborhood through here. And then as you look at those warmer colors in the REM, the greens and the yellows, this is probably where your willows are growing, where your cottonwood are growing or your cedars, whatever might be appropriate for your riparian forest and your given setting. And then those broad unconfined wetlands areas, that's gonna look more like the Brian's photo on the left. And if you think about a system like this and, and how say Chinook salmon might use this system, imagine a, a salmon spawning in that confined area. And as the fries come up out of those gravels and drift down into that massive rearing wetland complex that you see pictured to the left, just how rich that is and how much food that environment provides so again, just want to share that it's not all one thing. You have a, a great amount of diversity on this landscape. And, and I think that provides so much for salmon recovery. And when we can start at whole watersheds or subwatersheds and linking up together these ribbons and how they all might interact with one another, I, I think the impacts become very much additive. Okay, so... To make this relatable to, to you guys, I wanted to grab a river that you would be familiar with and, and try to translate some of this in, in, into a landscape or a setting you might recognize. So from back in my days getting to visit BC, I remember the Bella Coola being one of those uh, prime rivers. So I jumped on the internet and downloaded your LIDAR from Stewie down to Bella Coola down to going into the bay there. And so flow on the, on the LIDAR imagery is moving from right to left. And I apologize, my stationing, I, I start with zero, but though it's reversed. But I wanted to start with this segment of river and just break it into its different valley segments to see how this might look. So starting up there at the top from Stewie, you see the blue line comes in. That's kind of where I drew my valley center line. And if you look at the profile, that's where I broke that valley segment. So you see the, we have a definite hinge point and, and the valley profile changes at that location. So on the, on the plan view map and the LIDAR, I put a little circle there just to mark where those, where those breaks in valley type are. Valley segment two shown there in green. Valley segment three is a pretty short one. And then valley segment four is a nice long one before breaking into this uh, confluence fan delta moving into the bay. So those were the, let's see, five different valleys that I saw within this, this segment of, of the river. So let's dive in a little bit deeper now. Let's take that valley segment two, the one shown in green there, and take a closer look at that. So once I've marked those, those upper and lower extents of this valley segment, now I can start to analyze this one as a standalone valley. And so that's what I'm showing in this uh, graph. The, the black squiggle line that goes up and down, up and down, that's the, the bare earth LIDAR elevations beneath my center line. And so to make sense of this, I've got a, uh, let's see, a third order polynomial just detrending this 
particular valley profile. And so that math equation that I'm showing there on this screen describes the profile of this valley. And, and, and two things while I've got this up. First, I think one of the first questions that always comes up, people ask about slope. What's your valley slope? And, and I, again, I, I've shown other examples of this, but it's very, very rarely one slope, right? Depending on where you are in this valley, it's either steeper or lower compared to other areas. So to the left is steeper than the, the lower portion of this particular valley. And then again, that math equation will give me the target elevation, which is the dashed line that you see normalizing this valley. Every meter for this whole, whatever, we got 11 kilometers worth of valley here. So I'll be using those elevations to compare just like we did in that cross-section exercise. So just to pick one, and we'll, we'll use this in, as an example. But so at station 11,000 meters, our target elevation is about 100 meters elevation, okay? So if we zoom in to that segment of Valley Segment 2, I'm showing you my, my center line. That's the black line there. And again, I'm not following the Bella Coola River. I'm just going down the middle of the, of the valley between the toe slopes. So you can see the river sinuous underneath there. And I also want to show you that th these, these purple lines, those are the valley spanning cross sections that our tool is generating. And they're going to generate perpendicular to the center line. And so if you'll notice, there's a, a bend in my center line. So anywhere where I bend the center line to kind of curve with the fall of the valley, we're going to get that bow tie effect where the, the cross sections on the in, inside are going to overlap each other. And then on the outside, you'll have that gap without any cross sections. So just wanted to point that out. You'll see some data gaps where there's no color and, and that's why. All right. So cross section at station 10,000 meters is this one. And so our target elevation was about hundred meters there. So this cross section, what we're going to do is compare every elevation within that cross section relative to 100 meters. And then the same will be done for every other cross section in here. It'll be compared to whatever the relative elevation for that given stationing is. And we can color code them to see what your valley looks like. And so again, this is kind of the base color ramp I start with for all valleys. And then, and then we'll make adjustments to it as we move through. So, so basically, the, the light blue is going to be what I call a match to the geomorphic grade line. And the pinks are going to show us channelization or incision. And so here's the Bella Coola when it's all painted out with an REM. And so if we start at the bottom and, and make our way upstream, we'll see that we can see how constricted the valley is, that we've got pretty much a, a single thread river down there. And as we keep moving our way upstream, you'll see a little piece of the, the river shows with blue, less in size there than the others. And just to the south of that, there's a really, really large sediment fan coming in and, and shoving the Bella Coola all the way up to that north wall. The river is a single thread channel going around that feature, comes around a, a bit of a terrace, and then opens up into a broad anabranching type valley up above there. So. I'm going to pull the profile back in and stationed correctly this time. So you can see again, like we've shown in a couple other examples, the, the, the single thread and, and narrow confined segments of this particular valley are lower gradient than that broad unconfined segment up there at the top. Turning on the aerial image beneath this, I think this was the 2020 NAPE, somewhere around there. But anyway, uh, a little bit more context. We can see that rock wall to the north, um, very much a rigid outside boundary. Let's zoom into that Anna branching segment up there at the top. And so if, if we look at this, you know, this is the, the type of feature that I, or the product that I would want to take to the field and validate these elevations. But I'm doing it from a few hundred miles away, so I'm going to dummy it here and just kind of give you my interpretations and then make some adjustments. So the first thing that's catching my attention is obviously we've got the highway there to the north. 
And then on, on the other side of the highway to the right on this photo, we can see somebody's ag pasture. And then those, those dark pink channels conveying the water off of that feature and, and passing it underneath the highway to the, to the Bella Coola. So that was, would probably be, again, one of those large wetlands like we saw in the, in the first sampling. I'm seeing that the, the Bella Coola itself is fairly, it's all coloring as pink up through here, indicating that it's probably incised. I'm not seeing a lot of wood or complexity in the channel. But as we move to the south, there's a tremendous amount of this valley that is painted in the blue. So that's saying that those elevations match the valley profile. And then I also see some channels in there that are pink as well. And if I look at those, something that catches my eye, and I'm always, I'm probably biased, but I'm looking for these. I'm seeing a lot of linear kind of striations within in those pink channels. So you see the darkest pink, that's going to be the deepest area. So those look like drainage features cut into this uh, relic flow path. So I'm going to, on the next slide, I'm going to just take uh, the swipe tool and wipe away a bit of this uh, REM so we can see the nape beneath. And then when we look at this, I can see, again, it uh, looks like the Bella Coola is very colored up, moving probably a bunch of suspended sediments. It's got large gravel bars, so clearly this thing moves a lot of sediment, both bed load and suspended. Um, that, that pink channel... The one that I was saying looks like it's been manipulated certainly shows within this aerial image, but that whole suite of all those other little relic channels are pretty indiscernible from this aerial image. I also see some channels in there that are, uh, they don't look channelized, but they're still coloring as pink. So maybe I was a little too tight with my bracketing of colors. Maybe I should you know, instead of half a meter to zero being target, maybe I should lower that to 0.7 meters to, to zero being target. And so I can recolor the landscape and I've, I've changed the, the display just a little bit to kind of crisp or make those things sharper. But this seems to be a pretty good fit. Now I'm seeing the tops of those gravel bars in, in the river are basically, uh, we're getting those into the target elevation. But if we look at all that relic stuff to the south, Areas that look like they've been channelized or simplified are still showing as pink versus the rest is kind of in the blue. So again, we would want to validate all these elevations in the field to, to truth them. Do we have the bracketing correct? And I can do the swipe again, pull some of that color off of there and look at the image beneath. And, and it does look like that's been simplified. Um, I don't know if this has been harvested and such, but that, that, largest secondary channel to the south looks simplified and ditched. So anyway, what we would eventually get to is, okay, what was our restoration scheme look like for this valley segment? And so if we were to remove the channelization and incision elevations and bring everything to the geomorphic grade line, this is kind of what our base flow wetted environment would look like for the Bella Coola. And I think at this point, you know, when we start to visit with people and show them what could be and what's within reach, I think a lot of times people get excited and, and they recognize the value of getting water into all these relic flow paths. And the first question is, okay, how do we do it? And I think a lot of times people will want to start up here at the top and do things like build log jam complexes within that current river and displace flow out of it and, and have it reoccupy these, these channels to the south. But before doing that, you know, I think it's, it's wise to relook at how did this valley form, right? We spent the whole morning talking about geomorphic controls and, and the evolution of these valleys, how they got here. It started with that geomorphic control, control at the bottom, a, a plug basically, and then sediment accreting headward for centuries and millennia after that. So with restoration, we'd wanna be looking at the same thing, start at the bottom Additionally, if we start at the top here, remember this is the steepest part of this given valley, so, and, and the most incised. So you've got the most head to overcome, and then if you do overcome it, you've got a tremendous amount of hydraulic head going over. So high risk of those features failing and or just cutting, creating more head cuts. 
So zooming back out to kind of put a pin in this, our geomorphic control is down here at the left where we've got this big feature coming in out of the south constricting flow and also that fan coming in the north. And so this is again where we had our break in our profile creating headward accumulation of sediments. So I'm just using this as an example. Let's pretend there's a highway here and you cannot re regrade this to our geomorphic control, right? Is there a secondary one we might be able to use? Well, certainly this big feature coming out of the south provides a secondary opportunity to catch elevations. And if you can look at the REM, that, that segment of blue river right there shows us that this is the least incised piece of this entire valley segment. So meaning it's, it's the closest and it might be the easiest lift. So I'll show you a cross section of that given, of that location. And so on, on the cross section at the bottom, I've got the zero elevation for that cross section marked with a green line. So you can see this isn't bathymetric LIDAR, so this is the water surface we're seeing, but you know the water surface is maybe 0.3 meters below target elevation, so very close. That's very doable. Versus if we move upstream a little bit, now our water surface is uh, 0.7 meters below target elevation, so our incision is getting deeper as we keep moving up valley. And if we go back up into this anabranching network of areas, our water surface up here is about 1.88 meters below. And then all these little relic features that we were talking about in the center, you can see how those are oscillating right around that zero mark. So those are all pretty good. But if we go over to that, that pink channel to the south, again, it's about 1.7 meters below target elevation. So anyway, we would use all of this information to kind of come up with a restoration scheme. First, you know, what are we trying to get to? What kind of uh, fluvial process space are we trying to recreate or react, reactivate, I should say? And then how do you get there? So I've, to wrap things up, I've just got a couple of these three dimensional views with a bunch of vertical exaggeration. So you can really see the inputs of those of toe slope features and things that are outside the fluvial space. So this first one, again, we can see where that uh, geomorphic control break is. We've got these tall mountains on the south, big slide features running out into the valley, probably, again, very coarse material, not too erodible, creating that pinch point and, and backwater effect. You can also see that uh, tributary fan coming out of the south, just upstream of there, and then our valley opens up quite a bit, right? But also at the head of that valley, we see another very large confluence fan coming in from the north. So we have some really large features in here, really big sediment uh, delivery mechanisms. So we've got some things that we can work with. Just spinning around that same feature and, and now, now looking downstream, I just threw an arrow on a lot of these features. When you start to look at this, these will pop and you probably saw it to begin with, but. You can see more of these embankment type features, probably some protection of that highway, trying to keep that lat lateral migration from moving over and attacking the road. One more view, just kind of panning back out to get that whole valley segment. That's 11 kilometers worth of valley. And, you know, a restoration scheme. At this point, Damon and Jared did a really nice job of going through all of the different attributes and, and elements you want to analyze very deeply and have an understanding of, of your sediment load and time, what types of sediment, wh what kind of events are bringing those to you, etc. And so this is just my guessing, but it looks like the Bella Coola moves a fair amount of sediment. So this might be an instance where you can catch elevations with the heavy equipment at your geomorphic control and or that, that pinch there by the fan use those neighboring materials, again, the materials that created those points to begin with, and then headward of there, maybe all you need to be doing is installing a whole suite of log jams and or the beaver mimicry uh, type structures, things that are gonna help us to catch that mobile sediment and get the river to lift. And in doing that, you wind up with a, an environment that will look like this. So again, it's not all one thing. We do have some segments of single thread channel. 
but you also have some areas with the big wetland complex and then in areas with um, with those anabranching flow paths around vegetated islands. So again, I think once we can paint this picture, now you can start to analyze what, what might the ecological benefits of reconnecting this valley get for us. And with that, I will say thank you very much.